Okay, hello everybody and welcome back to the International, International Literature Showcase uh, the, and to, welcome to everybody uh, watching on the live stream. Uh, this is a new fiction event. Uh, I'm Swithin Cooper, I'm here from the British Council Literature Team and I'm delighted to be introducing uh, three young novelists, um, Kenan Jones, Emma Healy and Salma Dabba. Uh, between them their work spans from rural Wales to the English coast, London and Palestine and covers subject matter including dementia, family dynamics, grief and the point where the personal and the political collide. Each of the authors is going to read and uh, then they'll have a discussion about various different topics in their own books and uh, sort of uh, topics that come up in each of their work as well. I'm going to start with uh, Salma Dabba who is a British-Palestinian writer of novels, short stories and feature films. Much though by no means all of her writing is set in the contemporary Middle East and recurring themes in her work include idealism, placelessness, political engagement and the impact of social conformity on individuals, although in each case she explores the tensions and opposites contained within these subjects. Her first novel, Out of It, was published by Bloomsbury in December 2011, nominated as a Guardian Book of the Year in 2011 and 2012, and in September 2015, it will be published in an Arabic edition by Bloomsbury Qatar Foundation Press. Her short stories have appeared in magazines and anthologies including Wasafiri, The Letters Page and New Writing 15, and her play The Brick was one of the first Palestinian plays to be produced by BBC Radio 4. She's written for newspapers and magazines from The Guardian in the UK to GQ in India and regularly, regularly reviews fiction about or by Palestinians for the electronic intifada. She has appeared at national and international literary festivals from Frome and Guildford to Gaza and Jaipur and taught creative writing at schools and universities in the UK and the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you, Swithin, for the introduction. Can you all hear me? OK. Um, <clears throat> So I'm, we're going to start with readings, and I'm going to do um, probably one of the longest readings I've done for a long time. It's about 10 minutes, so brace yourselves. Um, it just works very well as a, as a standalone piece. Um, and uh, it's set, this part, my book is between Gaza, London, and the Gulf, and this part is set in uh, Gaza, and it's in the 1980s during what was what was known as the First Intifada, which was a mainly non-violent resistance movement of Palestinians. And the main um, characters who are introduced here are a couple who've met and um, are about to marry. So it's a flashback from the main the main bulk of the book. So. Um, Lana had agreed to marry Sabri after a night spent huddled at the back of a Jerusalem cafe, listening to three hours of recitation of the story of the one-eyed ghoul. The audience had been rapt. Each line had been followed up by commentary from the coffee-drinking, argile-smoking gathering. He had watched her, looking towards the crowd in the soft light, with her hair the way he liked it, fluffed into curls at the front, hanging down long at the back, against the chain of red cross stitches running along the collar of her shirt. He had surprised himself by the thought that maybe this in itself could be enough, just to see her like that sometimes, to give her pleasure that way. Maybe he did not need to try to have her or even to touch her, but she must have felt his gaze because she had turned and, with a gesture that was both manufactured and aimless at the same time, popped a piece of sticky honeyed baklava into his mouth with her fingers, as though it was something she had done many, many times before. And then he knew that he had never thought anything quite so stupid in his whole life. Her family had opposed the marriage. They objected to Sabri's place of origin, to his religion and to the party he was affiliated with. They did not dare to voice their objection to his peasant lineage, as they knew that if they did, she would have only become even more determined to stay with him. But their objections did not stop Lana. Sabri and Lana had married in a small Jerusalem hotel where their faces were beamed by a video camera into hearts dancing on a wall, and Lana's head had been scraped with combs, rose stems, and metal pins. Her face had been whitened to that of a geisha. Like a death mask, she wished, whispered to Sabri as they placed her next to him on a raised velvet throne. He had lost her in this pile of tacky lace. This was not what they had wanted. The intifada was going on. Celebrations were banned. They had asked for something simple, old-fashioned, a dress with embroidery, hennaed hands, and a troop of men dancing the dubkit at most. 
They didn't want the hall, or the mealy-mouthed waiters, or the Lebanese and Egyptian pop music about lost love and dying hearts. But both families had vetoed their modest plans absolutely, far more effectively than they had vetoed the marriage itself. I want you to take that off now, he had whispered back at her. What, this, she said, pointing up at her face, or this? And she had plucked at the neckline of her dress, revealing just enough cleavage to drive him wild. Afterwards, his extended family commented on how inappropriate it was that she looked so relaxed. She had not appeared to be intimidated by the prospect of the night that was to follow. But she had neither cared about upsetting everyone then, nor had she cared later when she screamed at a delegation of women from Sudbury's family who had come to ululate outside their window. But I thought you liked tradition, custom, hmm? Subri had asked after the women had obediently got lost, his nose nuzzled against her cheek, his bent knee resting against the side of her newly waxed one, the agitated voices of the dismissed women dying away outside. All traditions and customs, except for those that subjugate women and deprive them of their sleep. She turned to him so that their noses touched and other pleasures. Naji had been born nine months later, disappointed by his surroundings. The baby's colicky objection to the universe rarely subsided. From being dedicated to the pursuit of national liberation, his parents' lives were transformed into a perpetual quest to find something, anything, that would quell their son's grief. There was no pattern as to what pleased him. On some days, it was the afternoon sunlight fluttering between the leaves of a tree. On others, touching the shorn head of a boy's, shorn hair of a boy's head would make him gurgle and coo. His toes curled into each other with excitement. He was, according to all who met him, a cranky baby, and his parents sometimes said that he was only saved from being given up on altogether by the look of absolute trust that he gave them when he fed. With his mouth around the bottle's teat, he would make an eye-to-eye plea for understanding of quite how difficult it was, how hard it was for him to accept his disappointment. His eyes would widen, one hand holding onto the bottle, the other seeking out tenderness of any kind, a hand to hold and play with, a forearm to stroke. Like everyone else in Gaza, they were living the intifada, and it was still going strong. Sabri had had to go underground on more than one occasion, hiding in the camps for long periods. It was a time of smuggling messages across the border in swallowed sealed capsules, of army raids to remove fax machines, of banned flags, songs and school books, classes being held at home with the curtains drawn, of food being grown in back gardens and, and... and boycotted produce being smashed against the walls in front of cheering crowds. These were the heady days of resistance, heady days indeed. It was in that first year of their marriage when, buoyed up with international support, the occupied leadership had made a declaration of independence. Sabri, like many, had made was sure that it would work. Legally and morally, as he kept stressing to his audiences, the position could not be disputed. And even Lana, Sub reassured himself, almost confessed to being in accordance with the leadership's position. The occupier's response to the declaration was predictable, but harsh. A curfew had been imposed, and all lines of communication with the outside world were severed. Sabri needed to speak to his leaders to let them know what the situation was on the inside. He needed to find a phone line that had not been cut. We could try the hospitals, Lana suggested. I wouldn't get through the roadblocks. The army's everywhere. We could come with you. If they can stop us, we say that Najee's ill. I'm sure the doctors will allow you to make a call. That's not what I'm worried about. No, I'd rather you didn't come. What is it? You want us to stay at home? Do you want me to take up crochet too? The army's very jumpy at the moment. I don't think we should take unnecessary risks, Sabri said, putting a bent finger into Naji's mouth for him to chew on. You do want us to stay at home, don't you? That's not it, Sabri said. One year into marriage, he was already getting sloppy about hiding his petulance from his wife. How else are you going to talk to them then? There's no other way. Stop arguing about it. We'll go tonight. 
The night before, Najee had slept and they had managed to be together in a way that they had not been for such a long time. And well into the next day, he could feel himself inside her. The night had wound itself around them throughout the day, tying them back together to each other. He had not wanted it to break. He had not wanted to argue with her. Sabri's car had been parked outside the gate for so long that he was not sure it would start. They had spent a long time deciding what outfit Najee should wear, trying to imagine what would appeal to the soldiers at the checkpoints and settling on a sailor suit that had been a present when he was born. They were still fussing as they started loading themselves into the car about whether made-up powdered milk bottles could be reheated and where the spare nappies were. They kept asking each other whether Najee was going to be warm enough and going backwards and forwards on the question as to whether it was better for Najee to be in a car seat in the back or on Lana's seat in the front. They had been hissing at each other as Najee had been asleep. Lana said it was more convincing for the baby to be with her. And so Sabri had tucked Najee in on his mother's lap and had put the spare nappies by her feet, the water bottle by her side, and the dummy wrapped in cling film into the glove compartment. He had walked around in front of the car, irritated, until he looked up and he saw his wife through the windscreen, her hair bent down over their son. And he had felt the old pride that they were his, his family. They had just exchanged a final all right, as he put in the key into the ignition, when Najee, predisposed to diarrhea, produced something of such vast and gaseous proportions that it woke him up into a state of bawling indignation. Sabri had looked at his watch. I'll do it upstairs, it's easier, Lana said, opening the car door, leaning backwards to get out, making her way to the porch, jogging the bundle of key and baby and blanket with one arm as she searched in her back pocket for the door key with the other. They had been a while, seven minutes. Sabri had waited. The moon had been full that night, an orange disc strung between the buildings at the end of the road, shining like a Ramadan lantern. Sabri had seen the bedroom light go on. He had heard Najee's wails from the window and had been able to make out the murmur of Lana's comforting. The crying continued as a light went off and Najee had only stopped as they entered the stairwell. Sabri had seen them come back out onto the porch. He must have turned the key in the ignition when they reached the gate. He wasn't sure. It was a guess. He did not know what had happened. He could not remember. Something white and definitive had blasted reality from him, and then they were gone. The psychiatrist who visited Sabri in the hospital afterwards said that it was surprising he remembered so much but it was all untrustworthy. If asked what his last memories were before the explosion, he would have said that they were being with Lana and Najee on the staircase. He could clearly see them walking down the stairs, Najee in a beige blanket with a satin rabbit, rab, satin rabbit in a bow tie in the corner, his hair tufty with patches of baldness at the back, where the softness had been rough, rubbed off by sleep, a face blotchy from tears, his eyes trying to focus on the thick blue ceramic tiles outside the neighbor's door. There was Lana, too, her blow-dried hair stuck behind her ears, lipstick remaining only on the edges of her lips, her hand on Najee's back. But for all its clarity, it was a scam, that memory, a fabrication. He could not have seen them on the stairs. He had never been on the stairs with them. He had been in the car. To hell with memory. It was like feeling around in a basket of apples, only to be confronted by a snake. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next author we're going to hear from is Emma Healy. Uh, Emma's the author of Elizabeth is Missing, which won the Costa Prize for Best First Novel, saw her shortlisted for the National Book Awards New Writer of the Year, and is currently on the Bailey's Prize long list. She wrote her first short story when she was four, told her teachers she was going to be a writer when she was eight, but by the age of 12 had decided on being a litigator, inspired entirely by the film Clueless. After completing her first degree in bookbinding, she worked for two libraries, two bookshops, two art galleries and two universities until 2008 when, after the death of one grandmother and the decline of another, she began to explore the idea of dementia in fiction. She studied for the MA in Creative Writing at UEA and published Elizabeth is Missing in 2014. Thank you very much. Um, so the book is about um, Maud, or told by Maud, who is in her 80s, and is living with dementia, and she is convinced that her best friend Elizabeth has gone missing. All the people around her 
tell her that her friend is not missing, that she's just forgotten having seen her recently, um, but she's determined to investigate anyway. Uh, I'm just going to read about five minutes, maybe just over, and uh, it, all you really need to know is that Carla, her carer, has also been trying to um, divert her attention from her search for her friend. Carla has suggested I try church. She's a Catholic and thinks it might be a comfort in some way. I've surrendered and let her give me a lift to the service this morning on her way to another old crone. I insisted on an Anglican church, though I don't really believe in any particular God and I'm not sure what to expect. Ma stopped going to Holy Communion after Suki went missing and I never restarted the habit. Patrick didn't believe in anything either and Helen is quite a determined atheist. But lots of old people go to church. Elizabeth goes. The church she goes to is an ancient stony building with comically serene-faced martyrs in the stained glass. Everyone in the congregation is a bit dressed up, or they've made some effort anyway, winding silk scarves around their necks or sliding sparkly things into their hair. I feel rather drab and shy for a few minutes, but then I remember that I am old and nobody is looking at me. I take my hymn book and sit down. Hymns ancient and modern, I read. A couple of people turn to look at me. There can't be more than a dozen people here. The smell of wood and polish reminds me of school. It's quite comforting, as is all the shined brass and flower arrangements. I start to understand why the elderly go to church. There are flowers on the end of each pew and I reach a hand out to brush the petals in the nearest arrangement. One of the flower heads comes away and I close it in my fist. The action is familiar and I repeat it, opening my hand before crushing the flower again. But I can't think what it means. And anyway, it's the wrong sort of flower. It should be a yellow marrow flower and these ones are white as if left over from a wedding. Perhaps someone got married yesterday. Young people still do that in church, I'm told. I squeeze my fist while the vicar clears his throat and people on the other benches bow their heads in prayer. The petals of the flower are soft and crushable. I like it like this, mangled and real rather than stiffly sitting in its arrangement. These bunches on the pews are too much like those you find preserved under Victorian glass domes, crisp and dry and slightly unnerving. We stand and sing and sit and pray. I'd forgotten how tiring these services can be. I can't keep up and I lose track of where we are, so I just mime along with everything. The vicar looks puzzled when he sees me moving my mouth during his talk, his speech from the pulpit. Finally, it's time for tea. There's a huge metal urn on a trolley at the back of the church and lots of greenish cups, far too many for the number of people. A woman in a padded body warmer, the same colour as the cups, comes towards me with a tin of biscuits. We haven't seen you before, she says. No, I say. And then I go blank. I can't think where I am or why. I wobble slightly on the flagstones and my breath catches. I take two biscuits from the tin, balancing them on my saucer. Are you local or visiting? she asks. I don't know, I say, feeling foolish and panicky. I mean, where are we exactly? She smiles. It's a kind smile, but it's full of embarrassment. This is St Andrews. The name means nothing. I don't like to ask anymore. Perhaps you usually go to the chapel, she suggests. There's one just a couple of streets away. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. I shake my head. I haven't forgotten my religion. I know I'm not a Wesleyan or Baptist or anything. I'm not even really a Christian. Sorry, I say, I'm a bit forgetful. The woman looks as though she thinks this description doesn't quite cover it, but she nods and takes a sip of tea before introducing me to the vicar. Luckily, I have been practicing my name in my head. How do you do, the vicar says, shaking my hand. His hands are incredibly soft, as if they have been worn smooth by the amount of handshaking he has had to do. I hope you enjoyed the service. 
I wasn't aware that it was the sort of thing you were supposed to enjoy, so the question rather takes me by surprise. Oh, I say. He and the woman and the body warmer start to move away, frightened off by my inarticulacy, and I look down at my tea and biscuits, uncertain what to do with them. I watch as a man takes two sugar lumps from his saucer, drops them into his tea and stirs, and with a sigh of relief, I do the same with my biscuits, stirring the pulpy mixture round and round. When I look up, everyone in the little group of people is staring at me, except the woman in the body warmer, whose eyes are fixed on the ceiling. She nudges the man next to her and he coughs. No, she wasn't well at all, he says. It was Rod who found out about it. He used to pick her up, didn't you, Rod? A small man with a comb over nods. Yes, that's right, he says. So naturally, her son rang me. I told him we'd pray for her. Actually, I'd been to the house several times needlessly before I got a call. Rather annoying. Stood outside waiting and no answer. Elizabeth, I say suddenly. I hadn't meant to. The woman in the body warmer looks at me, finally. Elizabeth, I say again. She's missing. Yes, that's right, dear. She is missing from our congregation. Never mind, she turns to the others. I bite my lip in humiliation, but I must catch at the chance before I forget. No, I say, I've been looking for her. She isn't at home. Not at your home, the woman asks, careful with each syllable. She really is very irritating. I suppress the urge to scream. No, no, she's a friend of mine. She's gone missing. The comb-over man frowns and smooths a hand over his head. The long, thin hairs seem to be embedded in his scalp. She's not missing. Where is she then, I ask? I've been to her house. Well, dear, the woman says, looking at the group. Perhaps it was the wrong house. Her voice is quiet, as if she doesn't want anyone to hear her suggestion. But her words are very clear, and they are listening closely. The vicar coughs and shifts his feet, and the other man smooths his head again. Her tone is final, and I can already feel the conversation moving on. In a moment, someone will mention the weather. I get a flash of heat. How dare they dismiss me, these people who are supposed to care about Elizabeth? How dare they? I didn't go to the wrong house, I say, quietly, steadily, the assertion making me feel like a small child. I'm not stupid. Elizabeth is missing. I take a shuddering breath in the silence. Why don't you care? Why won't anyone do anything? I think I'm beginning to shout, but I can't help it. Anything could have happened to her. Anything. Why will no one do a thing to help find her? Frustration constricts my breathing. I squeeze the cup in my hand and then throw it at the ground. It smashes easily on the stone floor of the church and the sound rings through the building as the syrupy, crumb-filled tea soaks into the mortar between the flagstones. The woman in the body warmer puts down her cup and picks up the broken remains of mine. Perhaps I'd better take you home, she says. She leads me gently away from the vicar and puts me in her car, and she is very patient when I give her the wrong directions to my house and we have to go around the one-way system a second time. As she drives along, I write a note to myself. Elizabeth not at church. The woman sees me writing it and reaches over to pat my hand. I shouldn't worry if I were you, dear, she says as she helps me out of the car. God looks after his flock. You must look after yourself. She offers to collect me for church next Sunday, but I tell her I'm not really up to it. She nods in understanding, and there is a touch of relief in her smile. Thank you. Uh, Kenan Jones was born on the west coast of Wales in 1975. He's the author of four short novels, The Long Dry, Everything I Found on the Beach, Bird, Blood, Snow, and most recently The Dig, which came out last year and brought comparisons to Ted Hughes, Cormac McCarthy, and Ernest Hemingway. His first novel won a Society of Authors Betty Trask Award, while The Dig won a Jerwood Fiction Uncovered Prize in 2014. A chapter from it was shortlisted for the 2013 Sunday Times EFG Private Bank Short Story Award. 
His work has been translated into several languages and his short stories have appeared in anthologies including Granta and the New Welsh Review. He's currently working on another book. Uh, with a dig, I wanted to write about the way that we try to create a safe space for ourselves and, and what we care about and how a force can break into that space. And that force uh, comes in the form of a, of a big man, this nameless character, and it falls to him to open the book. He pulled the van into the gateway and dropped the lights. It was a flat night and the van looked a strange alien colour under it. For a while he sat there carefully. It was lambing time and here and there across the shallow valley and variously on the hills there were lights on. And while it looked to him from this distance like some community at work, he knew that all those farms were involved in their own private processes. Processes in their nature give or take the same, but in each space of light carried out in isolated private intimacy. He looked out across the scape and recalled in those wells of light those farms which were sympathetic or against this thing that he did. In his time he had covered most of the ground and in his mind drew vaguely the shapes of the lands that attached to each farm and called back the names of each property he knew, as if he were noting constellations. It was a time of mixed certainty for him with these people awake at night, but they were also busier and distracted, and with that general busyness disregarded noises more readily, accepted them as a product of another's work, attributed more readily the distant bark of dogs. He was a gruff and big man, and when he got from the van it lifted and relaxed, like a child relieved of the momentary fear of being hit. Where he went, he brought a sense of harmfulness, and it was as if this was known, even by the inanimate things about him, as if they feared him somehow. He opened the back of the van, and the wire inside the window clattered, and he reached for the sack and dropped the badger out, spat into the dirty tarmac beside it. The dogs had pulled the front of its face off, and its nose hung loose and bloodied, hanging from a sock of skin. It hung off the badger like a separate animal. He knew the crows would sort that. He kicked the badger round a little to unstiffen it. He kicked the head out so it lay exposed across the road. Its top lip was in a snarl and looked exaggerated and some of the teeth were smashed above the lower jaw, hanging and loose where they had broken it with a spade to give the dogs a chance. They hadn't had the ground to dig a pit so they had fastened the badger to a tree to let the lurchers at it and its hind leg was skinned and deeply wire cut. That could be a problem, he thought. That could be a giveaway but everything else was fine. The other injuries would be disguised. The badger's underbelly was torn and ripped where they had let the terriers at it before he had finished it off with a shovel. Dog was good tonight, he thought. She was good and persistent. The badger's teats were pronounced and swollen with feeding and several of them were torn off. The, the pelt was slick with a mix of blood and milk. It's a shame we didn't get the cubs, he thought. And he thought about tearing off the leg but knew he wouldn't be able to. And he was suddenly repulsed by the idea of touching the badger again, of giving it reverence. The idea of hiding this axe suddenly made the big man angry and fatigued. He'd been up all night and the walk and the hard digging and adrenaline made him tired, though it came up only as a swelling of anger in him. He got back in the van and it sagged under his weight. He took off the gloves and threw them into the passenger seat, bearded with dog hairs. A little way down the road, he turned the van round, came back and drove over the badger. Then he turned round and did it again. He let the van idle and got out and stood over the sow the skull now smashed a remnant. He looked at the leg and it still stood out like butchery, unnatural and premeditated. Bitch. Then he ground his foot down on the leg and stamped over and over, smashing the thin precise line of the wire out of the raw flesh. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, each of you for that. I was just wondering, uh, to begin with, if uh, you've already talked a little about kind of what you wanted to do kind of with the novel, but if each of you just wanted to sort of say a few words about the inspiration behind uh, the story and how you sort of came to find the style you wanted to tell it in, um, I don't know if you want to start. Um, yeah, um, well, the novel, I sort of started off, I had this intention of writing a huge historical novel about Palestine because there have been a lot of critics saying that there was no... There was no epic work that put the, the, the history of the tragedy of Palis the Palestinian tragedy into a sort of no novel form. I mean, that position's changed a bit since then, but I had this idea that I had this big 
work which set out like 1948, 67, and it was a very particular political objective, but the closer I got to the work, the less I wanted to do that, because I felt I'd read, for me, I'd read quite a lot of this in memoir already, I felt it was ground which was quite well covered. I wanted something which was more a snapshot as to where we are now, and I wanted something very pacey. I wanted it to be quick. I felt that it was very... I felt there was so much energy in Palestine, and I felt that it would be really pulled down by the, the weight of this history if I allowed too much of it in. So um, I think in terms of a question, I liked what you said about the safe space idea. I mean, it's, it's a theme that comes up in a lot of my writing. But it was, I think, I, I was really interested in this issue of political consciousness as a sort of social pressure and people being in a situation which isn't exclusive to the Palestinians at all but is particular with them of like being told you know or being expected to be politically involved in a situation but actually um, to not really find a way or to have to be dealing with a sort of secular group of people in the, in, a, in a middle ground who can't find a way to engage in a meaningfully meaningful meaningfully or to opt out so it was this no man's land in the middle so the effect of political consciousness i think on on the individual and what happens to their personal space was the thing i was exploring i think that's really interesting just because obviously we see in the novel you uh you sort of set up interesting things that then don't go the way we expect as readers so rashid at one point in the novel sort of <laughs> almost sort of wishes that he could have the privilege of not being from a troubled country yeah. but then we see him go on a a very different journey to what we would think that we, he wants to just get out and get to London and then we actually see the novel completely turns our expectations kind of on its head the same thing happens with Amman she seems very involved at the, at the beginning of the book and by the middle she's also in London but she's sort of retreated inside herself yeah. was that something you you knew they wanted to go on that journey or was that something that just developed as um, you wrote it, it's curious with characters because, I mean, you can start off with ideas about how they should be and then they sort of take on their own life and they start reacting against each other. But I definitely wanted with, with Rashid, and I kind of identified with him a bit more than the female character, strangely. But, I mean, he's, he's not actually a political individual. I mean, I, most people, you know, in stable societies, and I think they're not. You know, that's the luxury, but he's not, he can't afford that luxury. So he feels he keeps being drawn into being more being forced into being more politicized and trying to fight it but he gets to a sort of a point and for me that was the important point where he realizes how much it could mean to him i think it was something somebody said to me when i went to the when i went to jerusalem when i was 22 I and mean, he there were very high standards put on you as, as an individual and he said to me i am here and he also had the option of leaving he had a foreign passport and he said I'm here and I will die here and you have to know that if you come to this place and it's it was just a very kind of like as a 22 year old graduate it was just a very high sort of standard and I kind of wanted that movement with Rashid to get to a point of knowing how much it could mean to him. Thanks very much. Um, Emma, uh, yeah if you just want to talk a little about kind of the inspiration obviously it comes from a personal place as you sort of talked about in interviews yeah. before. Yeah um, so my grandmother has multi-infarct dementia, um, and she's a, about the sixth, I think the sixth member of my family uh, to have dementia in one form or another. So it's something that I'd been living with since I was about 15, 14 maybe, like the knowledge of these uh, various members of my family um, forgetting things or acting strangely. And I had been kind of trying to write something about it since then. I always thought it would be an interesting way of exploring maybe what they were going through. I always felt there was something else, like something buried, some logic that I couldn't get to that I thought fiction might help me with. But I didn't really know what to do with it. I mean, I wrote some short stories, but they sort of fizzled out. Um, and then my grandmother was in the car with me and my dad one day, and she said, my friend is missing. And it turned out her friend wasn't missing. She was just staying with her daughter in another town. But uh, I thought, well, what if she had been? Or what if my grandmother had been at stage in her dementia when she couldn't have remembered that uh, answer? And that's when the book really began for me. Um, and I kind of started to try and write it in this kind of horrible, like, third person interspersed with a stream of consciousness I and mean, it was just it was like this awful like chunks of stream of consciousness I'd, I mean they were awful really really ugly and uh, I started to like refine it and refine it and I realized that actually what I wanted to do is write it first person present tense and that that worked because if she can't remember the last scene we, we could only be with her in that moment 
Um, and then there's a kind of past tense story to relax into um, that's more kind of familiar, I guess. At what point did you know you wanted to have the... So, um, uh, as well as the present tense story, there's a past tense story about um, Maud's sister going missing uh, when Maud was a teenager, which um, sort of forms the centre of many of the chapters. She sort of falls into the memory and comes back out into the present. And I was just wondering, at what point did you know you wanted to, as well as having her, the progression of her dementia, at what point did you know you wanted to hang it on this, this other mystery that's not just Elizabeth? Uh, well, a lot of that came from research. So um, one of the things that kind of comes up over and over again with people with dementia is that they will repeat patterns of behaviour. So if, for instance, you were an avid gardener when you were younger, uh, you would carry on trying to go out and deadhead the roses, despite the fact that the roses are no longer in existence. They're just they're gone. So you would carry on with this kind of uh, slightly obsessional kind of uh, behaviour. And so I knew if she was going to have a, an investigation that she was obsessed by... In the obsessed with in the um, present that she was going to have something that she was obsessed with in the past, some, something that would be the kind of constant trigger, um, and that's really why. But then, I mean, it's, I thought it was going to be tiny, very, very tiny, like it would just be an explanation, and it started to get bigger and bigger. And so, um, and actually, the more I understood about dementia, the more I realised how important it would be to not only give the reader something to slip into, but actually, Maud had to slip into a, a past that feels easier for her because the present is becoming more disintegrated and confusing, whereas this past, however upsetting it might be, uh, is lucid for her. Thank you. Um, you've talked a little already uh, about the, the sort of inspiration of what you wanted to do with the novel, but um, I was wondering if you could sort of expand a little on... Yeah, it tends to be what I, what I look for. There's, there's things which fascinate you that you want to write about, which are human dilemmas. And in most of the things that I've written, there's been a collision with some sort of natural allegory. So the, the first novel, for example, is about a cow, a calving cow that goes for a walk. And they do that sometimes. They, they're, when they're with calf and they're close to giving birth, they can just become very stubborn and decide that they're going to go. And they'll push through gates, they'll climb hedges, they'll disappear. And that really provided a perfect allegory for, I think, the way a lot of people go through life, through relationships, through careers, with their head down, just stubbornly pushing forward. So... I say that, that, sort of, that sort of theme of using stuff that's in the world around me and feeding it in as a way of illuminating a human dilemma um, was what I was interested in looking at here. As I've said, that safe space we try to create, the Badger set was this wonderful allegory for that and the fact that people dig, them, dig badges out of those places and then do uh, this sort of sport, if you want to call it that. Um, but initially, it was... I was under huge pressure to write a longer book. Um, so I thought I'd cheat and, and essentially write two shorter books and stick them together with an overarching kind of line that went through them. So originally, The Dig was the second book of two. And uh, the first book was set in the 1940s about an Italian who's interned and sent to the Isle of Wight, and then sent on to a West Wales farm as an agricultural labourer. And as a result of relationships he forms there, there's this sort of final, uh, there's this denouement, which this then picks up, the dig picked up as a contemporary thing. So, uh, and there was a character which linked the two books. And it was about 90,000 words, and much more based around memory. It was called Traces of People at that point, and it was really very much about how people leave memory traces around. But when I read it through and I said, my agent, the same, we just sort of looked each other in the eye and went, it's, it's the story of the badger baiter and the farmer. That's the book. That's what you do. Um, so I cut 60,000 words in one fell swoop and um, yeah, wrestled a bit with the, with the remaining character. There was a third character in this for a while that was the link, and eventually he had to go as well. So it went down to 28,000 words. So. Yeah. Um, so when you kind of came up with those two, the, the farmer and then, the, the, you know, the big man, did you come up with them kind of, you always knew they were going to be in opposition to one another? Did one character come and then the other one came sort of as his opposition? Or? Uh, no, they were, they were absolute polar opposite. I mean, even down, I think the, in the way that you're trying to, when you write a menu, for example, you're always trying to look at links that go all the way through that to create, a, you know, some sort of cohesion, some... Uh, some, something that the, someone is eating those different dishes one after the other will pick up a through thread. So even when I say the allegory of the badger set and the badger, even the black and white element of the badger was something which I wanted to try and reflect in the black and the white of the character, those two absolute opposites. 
And I actually wrote the, both narratives separately. I wrote the narrative of Daniel the farmer, and I wrote the narrative of the badger baiter. And then it was a case of structurally bringing them together in a way that the reader has to feel very, very quickly that there's a, there's a tension there, that there's this kind of compression between the two characters. Without them really meeting, that was quite a difficult uh, thing to pull off narratively. Um, and then, absolutely that. You, the, the characters, are, for me, are people that I wait until I know exactly what they're doing before I go near the desk in an ideal world. You know, I, I don't write until essentially I can replay everything in my mind and then I just try and write it down as if I'm watching it, really. Thank you. Um, I'd like to kind of move on to a bit of a more general discussion because there are things I think each of the books touches on uh, sort of in, in different ways. Um, I think one of the one that, ones that was most striking to me when I read them is there's a sort of political angle to each of these books. Um, obviously, uh, there's this sort of most, most clear kind of in out of it that we see these characters kind of wrestling with the fact they live in a political space, uh, whereas in Elizabeth is Missing, the, the issue of round-the-clock care for working families um, is sort of, it's always, it's mentioned by the characters, but it's not really, you know, it, come, it just comes through naturally through their life. Likewise, the issues of badger baiting, for the big man, that's his livelihood. It's kind of how he survives, and he has this kind of cash in hand life that is in opposition to the farmer, um, which kind of the last third of the book really kind of, this is where everything meets a head. Um, and um, yeah, I was just wondering how conscious each of you were about these elements when you went into the story, um, sort of how much research you felt you needed to do. Um, I don't know if anyone would like to start. Um, I personally, I love the fact that you found the political in these other two, in these three very different books, because I'm constantly... You know, it, it's the main thing I'm asked about my book, and I feel most art, most literature is political on one level or another, and it's just fantastic that you found um, found this this link between us, which I think is there. Um, uh, and it's something, but it's something that I think is very particular in in writing about Palestine or Palestinian fiction because it's it's almost like there's presumed to be in Western fiction the idea that there's that it's apolitical or it's non-political or it's, it's not about politics. It's no, this is no forum to, to push an issue of any kind. That's kind of like to take your, you know, your art form to the barricade. It's, like, it's all sort of a little bit unseemly. But in anything written about Palestine, it's, it's almost considered to be foremost. Your objective should be to push the cause. And I found that to be very difficult and problematic as well. So I'm, I'm very acutely aware of... Um, the, the, the tensions and, and how difficult and how, how you can really only do it very lightly, I think. I think you can only have so, so much horror in any, in any particular book because I think the natural inclination for people is to move away from horror, you know, like trying to read a f human rights report first thing in the morning. It doesn't matter how well motivated you are, it's pretty unpalatable. So you have to pick out particular scenes, particular incidents, particular, you know, maybe one character, one... And, and then make sure that the characters, you're so engaged with the character that it's, it's the thing that happened to them. It's not, this is the, you know, that their, their existence, which is a media vision of, of political horror. The media vision is like that almost that person existed and waited for the moment that that point of horror was arrived at them and their whole life is defined by it. Where it's like, actually, it's this character. And just incidentally, they happen to have been the person who was you know, run down, attacked, or whatever. So to the building it up of it is, is the more important thing. Um, yeah, I agree about being as light as possible. And like, that's what I, I was really interested in, how we look at older people in our society. And I definitely saw a difference between uh, older family members who lived in Scotland and who lived in England. In Scotland, they get twice as much <laughs> care, or even four times as much care. I mean, just as standard as we do in England. So... Uh, so that was pretty shocking, seeing that people would, for instance, with my mum's mum, would have to get in and out of her house in 15 minutes. I mean, it just wasn't nearly enough. She was almost completely blind. Just, it was just ridiculous. But um, whereas my grandmother in Scotland got uh, half an hour twice a day, I mean, that's just the difference is huge. It's still not enough, but it's just amazing, the difference, because there's a much more kind of left-wing government. Um, and, yeah, I wanted to put that in. I wanted to look at how people ignore older people in our society. I wanted to look at uh, the ways that people are patronising or, or think, I mean, kind of in a similar way, that people kind of think that once you get to a certain age, you must always have been that age. Or that it kind of says something about your personality. You must be 
like sweet or you must be um, honourable or whatever, you know, or um, tolerant or I don't know, there's just always these kind of like ideas of what an older person is um, or racist or cranky or, you know, there's like one or the other. You're either like this horrific person you have to avoid or you're this kind of sweet old lady. So I was, I was kind of interested in that, that again, it was Maud's her own person as well. So I couldn't have put, I couldn't have put that in without her being a kind of 2D character who's here just to say those things. And because her daughter is struggling um, with care, uh, that's kind of how I guess we see it. But again, it's, it's not what Maud is concerned with. I mean, as much as she loves her daughter, she's, the fact that Helen is struggling is not something that Maud is even really aware of. So I guess we get it very obliquely. Yeah, I mean, po politically, this is, it's interesting because the, the, the writing about that human condition was why I did it, but it then completely accidentally coincided with badges in the news, if you like. Um, and they trialled it a year earlier. They tried, trialled the cull earlier in Wales. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but they abandoned it. It, was, it never happened, and it was then replaced with a badger vaccination uh, scheme. And in fact, during that badger vaccination scheme, they focused on, uh, essentially, just to put you in the picture, badgers apparently can transmit something called bovine TB to cattle, um, and that reduces the productivity of the cattle. You're not allowed to export the cattle, and you're not allowed to move them off the farm, so it's a financial sort of restriction on that. But they do still enter the food chain. We still eat the beef that has TB. It doesn't doesn't affect the, uh, the, the, the saleability of it in the UK. So the idea was to cull 70 to 80% of the badgers in the country. So they focus on these badger, the, the, these TB hotspots in, in the vaccination policy, and of the 1,424 badgers that they caught and vaccinated, there was 0% showing any signs of, of TB reactor. And it's the more research you do, the more bizarre that whole thing becomes. I mean, there's now refusals to release figures. There's all sorts of uh, strange stubbornness on the part of the government. 30 top scientists wrote an open letter saying this won't work. You're just going to make badgers run. And if they do have it, they will spread it further because they don't usually move out of a locality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that was not what the book was about. So I had to actually be very careful not to put the politics in there. You, when you research, you always have so much, and you, you have to resist putting your opinions and your, uh, what you found, even fascinating facts which you fall in love with. Sometimes there's no room for them in the book. You've got to be quite disciplined. So, yeah, there's a political edge to it, and it's apparent, it's, it's, for me, it's more important to provoke and to provoke an, uh, thoughts in, in the reader's mind and, and allow them to go and find the, the politic behind it. I think it definitely does that. I mean, it's, so, it's sort of so spare on the page that it allows us to kind of bring our opinions to it and it sort of presents these kind of ideas. Um, something I'm interested, interested to talk about um, that I actually thought we saw in each of the, the sections that you read um, is there's a... So you, you said the word horror earlier uh, when you were talking about kind of the issues and that is actually a, a very horrible scene. We actually we see, you know, the, the car bomb and he loses his family. Um, We've, at the beginning of the book, we know this character has already lost his legs. And so this is that moment where we find out how and oh, why. Sorry, I could have chosen something more uh, upbeat. No, 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 <laughs> not at all. I think it's very interesting because obviously there are so moments we see more being quite kind of violent and we see that moment where she's, she's not being, res her opinions aren't being respected. She's being very, she's spoken to as if she's a child um, in that moment in the church. And then, you know, we, we have this sort of description of the, the badger uh, and we know something has happened to us and we get these sort of small moments and I think what's really interesting in there's a sparity in the prose for each of you there where you don't kind of layer on the emotion or the tragedy it's presented in a way that allow that allows us to bring our that we draw that meaning from it without it having to be spelled out for us and I was wondering if that was difficult for each of you if you had to really kind of rework and refine the language or if you come from a do you write sparely already I think I did have to work on it a little bit, but I think it was kind of fairly instinctive uh, not to try and feel, do the feeling part for the reader. And there was a news reader, I can't remember his name, he used to report on war zones, and he, 
he would always tell you this was horrific and appalling and terrible and heartbreaking and it would get to the point where you think well you felt all the things so I don't have to I can switch I mean it was ridiculous because he was so involved and it was wonderful because obviously he hadn't got to that point where he didn't care anymore but it also felt like he'd done so much for the viewer that you weren't really required and I feel like that's the same with literature you, if you uh, if you write all the feelings in for the reader there's no work for them to do and I think being a reader I, I like to feel that I'm kind of meeting an author halfway rather than kind of everything being laid out for me um, but I think that comes with the second or third or fourth or millionth rewrite um, because that's when you are a bit more objective so I've been asked several times whether there were scenes in the book that were difficult to write and there probably were but only the first time or maybe the second um, by the twelfth rewrite of Lever I'm <laughs> feeling nothing and it's all just about the prose so, uh, so I think that probably helps <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it is really interesting how you, you work on a text so much that you have to essentially be completely immune to it, completely numb to it. I said recently in, a, in an interview that you, you have to write under a spell, and I tend to do that. I, said I, work, I work on everything in my head first, then I write it down, and it's generally a very, very quick, uh, concentrated process. And that's the only chance I think you have if, of knowing how a reader might feel about what you've just written, because pretty much five minutes after you've written it, you think it's crap basically. So you've got to really trust the instinct that you have when you put it on the page, and then you can look at that language in a much more uh, detached way and go, is, is every word doing the work it should do? I write very sparely anyway. I always have this idea that a description is going to take me a large paragraph, and quite often if you get it right and see it clearly, it'll take a sentence, because of exactly what Emma was saying, that readers are incredible, imaginative, creative people in their own right, so you just have to present them with the opportunity to, to react. Um, I said something else I said in the same interview, that I think there's a real difference between witness and voyeurism. Um, and when I was writing this, I was very conscious of the fact that what I was trying to do was put down a witness of these acts and not to, uh, not to make commodity of them, really. Um, no, I mean, it just ties on to you know, what I said, I think, the first before, which was really just, I think, and it's also it's more the test that you put in place when you're redrafting, when you're more thinking consciously about issues of how much political subject matter you've got in there or how, or, or if a scene is too complex, maybe there are too many things going on at the same time. It's, it's really that, that second time round that I think that I was, I was... I mean, my test for myself was that if any historical content or political content or any kind of messages like that weren't absolutely necessary for either character or plot, I was, they went. So I cut, you know, huge amounts out of this um, in the draft, redrafting process um, and just try to keep it clo as close to the, the, what the characters were seeing and feeling as possible. That is actually quite interesting. Um, so within the book, we know that Sabri is writing this political book, but I think we pretty much get about half a page of it. There's, it's described as him having a lump of papers on his desk, yeah. but we actually only see... Well, it's a big thing, you know, it's like there's this debates about what, do you, you know, what, what should art be in, in, in a political situation, or what should intellectuals be doing, and it's like there's this idea of just bearing witness. So Subri, in a way, he was very much a, a, a revolutionary, you know, very engaged, very charismatic. He had, you know, even the act of his, his marriage to somebody of a different religion, the way that they decided to lead their lives, was all completely, you know, it was, it was trying to set up a new world in a way, but then that was taken away from him. So now he's reduced. It's, it's a kind of impotency of just of monitoring, documenting. And um, it is something that you, you feel that... Um, I mean, I work for human rights organisations for a long time, and it's, it is sometimes you just feel you're just, you know, writing it down, you're just bearing witness. But it's important, it's very important, but it's also a little bit stagnating, you know. It's not challenging enough, it's not brave enough. Yeah. Um, one of the other things I think is quite important to each of the books is there's a sense of place that's very, very strong sort of in them. So Maud's world has kind of shrunk so much as a, as a result of her dementia that she really understands only a few streets. 
Um, and obviously, uh, your novel moves between various different areas. But when we when we first moved to London from Palestine, like the prose itself seems to change. There's this kind of airy quality to it, where we get this view of the skyline and all the different things that we haven't had on the kind of street level descriptions of Palestine. And obviously, your character is kind of very very rooted to the land that they're in. Do you, did the story kind of come from a sense of place? Do you find it easier to when you're trying to structure a narrative? Do you find it easier when you know that it takes place within a certain kind of geographical area? Uh, well, I'm always worried because people don't recognise where it, or some people recognise where it is and some people don't. I mean, it's really ostensibly set in Bournemouth, but because I basically cut a map up and stuck it back together so I could have the streets that I wanted next to other streets, which were probably a 20-minute drive away, I thought, well, I won't say it in the book because people say, that's not how you get here or that's not where the old cinema was. So I was... I wanted to create my own version of Bournemouth. Um, and also, I didn't like the way that the pavilion looked when I actually went in it. I had imagined it totally differently, so I decided it was going to be the way I imagined it. Um, so, so I always worry about place. I feel like sometimes people say, oh, well, I don't really know where it was. Uh, and I, I slightly felt that was kind of failing in the book, that I haven't really like, made it about this. It feels real in my head, but it's yeah. not a... So, so I worry about that. Um, so I'm really glad that you said that it was... <laughs> that's right. but, but, yeah, it's interesting. Um, but my, my Gaza is also totally invented. It's, it's stuck together from images and pictures and memories, and, and I think that's OK. And I, I had some people coming to me and saying, but look, there's no cafe like that. And it's like, I don't care, because there's a cafe like that in Ramallah, and I've decided that for my book, on my map, that's it. And it, it's sort of... And as long as I felt that there was nothing within within the, 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 the range of what the characters were doing, which was beyond, you know, it, it might not be possible, but it might not be probable, but it's possible. That was my test, you know, like, and if, and if it could potentially happen that you could get two such people in this cafe together, in that place, in that location, that far from, that was all right for the purposes of just, you know, you have to expect a sort of suspension of disbelief. But I think um, it's, it's very difficult to... Um, you know, I, I first started writing this novel at a kind of high-level reality, you know, and I didn't even want to name the characters because I felt Islamophobia and, you know, the, the reluctance to have anything to do with the Arab world was so pervasive that, you know, if I could just make them X's and Y's, like in a Boliano short story, that, you know, people would go in and absorb the characters more. So it was slightly high-level. And then I just thought it, I, couldn't, I couldn't kind of pull it off long enough. I wanted it to be the novel and I couldn't, so I brought it down to ground, but it wasn't, and I brought it down to ground in Gaza, but it wasn't really a real Gaza. It was like this piecemeal Gaza, and I couldn't get into Gaza at the time I was writing it, and went in after the book was published, which was quite kind of nerve-wracking, but, because I kept thinking, what have I got it just so wrong? But I, I didn't think I had, it was, but it was, but it it's feels, a, it, you it create, you invent. I've never like, been, but it felt, says. and also because everything that happens sort of, you know, geographically with the novel serves the character's story. You never sit there kind of questioning it and sort of saying, but why are they here? It doesn't ever feel like you're loading information and everything's serving the characters Good. and where they're moving well, next. Thank so. you. Yeah, but I don't know how many of you have seen the, um, the show Hinterland. It's a detective show set in the hinterland behind Aberystwyth. And it's really well written and it's really sort of cutting edge. It's brilliant, brilliant work, superb aesthetic where the landscape plays this incredible part. It's, it's a character in its own right. But it's got to the stage now where there's even letters to the local paper to say, why does he keep driving this way down the road in Anislas <laughs> to get to this station? That's not possible. It's given a false representation. And you, you just wonder whether those people should be allowed televisions. But, um, <laughs> With me, I think it comes from the pro I think the sense of place comes from the process in that, as I've said, I try and see the book, think of everything before going near the desk, and the focus is very much on the characters and what they do. And um, because I'm writing in a place that I know so well and, and so intimately that when I come to write, generally, I keep my eye on the characters. And all I have to do is look to one side of them, and I know, I know that place. I, can I don't fight for description. I try to fight for a a sense of place. It's not, it's not something I have to um, try to create, if you like. It's, it's keep the eye on the characters and just describe things clearly. Um, so it's fascinating to me that one of the major reactions I have to my work is the sense of place. So, so it's just something sort of natural within your style? Yeah. But my pl there's no place names. There's never a place mm -hmm. name in any of the things that I write. So.
but it comes through very strongly just in the feel. Of it, yeah, it's feel, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking of, uh, of place already, but also um, sort of when it, within each of your novels, we see certain kind of parallel structures that kind of come together, and sometimes it's place. So we, we get sort of, you know, we get Garzan skies, and um, it was the Garzan sea and the, the London skies, and other pl sort of the title names of your sections and we we see how how a character changes when they move to that space Rashid at the beginning of the novel is obsessed with being able to go to London and and Lisa the, the character who he knows is there and then one he once he's there in the novel it's it's completely different and um, and partly that's kind of who he is as a character and kind of what he's chasing but also it's it sort of enables you to completely contrast two different worlds and how people are treated and how people are seen um, when when they become the other at the point when they arrive in the story. Um, likewise, you've got obviously a past and a present. We've got the same town in two different worlds, but even even linguistically, we've got um, sort of in the present tense, Maud is losing language. Um, she can't even remember the, the names for certain things. Uh, and by the end of the book, she's replaced them with other other words. And then obviously you've got these two different characters who start off separately. They don't, they sort of cross paths as it were, or rather, you know, there's the concept of the badger set and one character saying he's never even seen a badger around here. And then they're right in each other's space as, as the story goes on. Um, I was just sort of wondering if you felt that there was, you know, was it that the story had to have these kind of, when you came up with the story, did it, it needed to have opposing structures? Was that something that helped to sort of give you narrative or to create those tensions that you could work through the characters or um, I mean I, I think I, I had them it the action occurring in lots of different countries because partly what I was looking at was the nature of being Palestinian now which is very you know there's a huge refugee population and a lot of people in diaspora and a lot of people inside you know inside and people so we're, we're a very dispersed uh, population who are always being asked to move and to uh, being restricted in terms of our borders, etc. So most Palestinian families have ended up with different members of the family in different countries. So we've become quite a sort of cosmopolitan and urbane and international, as well as being very localized and closed in. So there's this sort of sort of paradoxical relationship with the land because. Um, some people are so locked into it. I mean, Gaza is under land, sea, and air siege, so it, people can't move for, for, for fences. But then, on the other hand, that the families in Gaza, you probably find people with, you know, relatives all over the world and family and connections. So I wanted a sense of these different places, these different possible existences, and also to link, in some way, the diaspora, the diaspora with the internal, to find uh, what what's the common thread of being Palestinian now, because for me, it's an issue of a political engagement, you know, how uncomfortable do you feel when you watch the news? This is probably a key thing that connects people from Houston to Kuwait. So um, showing Palestinian existences in that, in these different scenarios was a way of doing that. Well, I said when I, I did a kind of a tiny interview before I came on and I said the thing I like about talking to other writers is that I will like say half a point and then a friend who's a writer will say something, kind of building on my point as if I've said it, and I'll <laughs> be able to take credit for it. And I remember talking to a friend about how uh, having kind of some time lapse, like something that's happening, say, in the 40s and something happening now, and I, I kind of couldn't get there. I couldn't, like, work out why it was important to me. And she was like, well, yeah, because, like you are saying, it's about resonance, so that's totally important for a book. And I was like, yeah, that's what I was saying. <laughs> that's completely it. It's about resonance. But that's, that is it. I mean, I didn't come up with that for my... My friend, they said they thought I had, so I took it. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's what it gave me. It gave me something to play off. So not only could I show Maud and give her a more rounded character by having things that she did in her teens that she now still does, or things that she thinks that she still does, it kind of gave the reader something to feel. So it's kind of that moment when you recognize something uh, in both times. Um, yeah, it's the resonance. So. As well as the resonance, I think there's obviously there are um, there are kind of opposites as well. We get to see 
a town where she completely understands everything and she knows where, we, where she's going. And we see that often later than the examples where we've seen a town where she doesn't know where she's going, where she's at the bus stop and she can't tell where she is, or she, you know, as, as in the section you read, she has to go around the one-way system twice and things like that. So yeah. it kind of, you know, it gives us more understanding of who she is now and what she's lost as well. Yeah, and also gave me an opportunity to put some kind of allegory in. So I knew that when I was started to write about 1946, that it was this kind of time of flux for Britain, that there were people moving around everywhere and it was all confusing and the streets were changed because of bombing and, um, and rebuilding and uh, prefabs and everything. It was all this kind of like st strange movement constantly and I thought that was a really good kind of reflection of what was going on in Maud's mind now. So it kind of gave me that satisfaction of creating something concrete um, in the fiction that was, that's kind of, yeah, reflected Maud's brain. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always slightly fraudulent talking about how you approached a novel, I think, once the novel's happened and it's out. Because I think, as a writer, so much of what you're doing is narratively instinctive. You're hyper aware of what you're doing, like a piano player is hyper aware of where the fingers are going down on the keyboard. But actually, once you're in the, well, certainly for myself, when you're in the process of writing, you're making these decisions perhaps not as consciously um, or as explicitly as, as you then say you did when you sit on a panel. Um, and looking back, you know, I knew, it's obviously something I knew instinctively, that the, the two men had to be, they're very different characters, and, and even the language had to reflect that. The act of lambing going through those weeks of, uh, of uh, that process up all the time, up at night, it's really tiring for two people. So to do that on your own, it does put you in this kind of uh, strange, semi-drugged state and, and, and this sort of slightly timeless state. So his language, Daniel's language, could be more biblical, more mythical in that respect. You could almost, and you have to be very careful pushing that edge because it can become overwrought if you're not with it. Whereas the, the, the big man is a more physical thing. So his language is more physical, more, more blocked, if you like. And even in that, that was creating this black and white, this indoor, outdoor, this day, night. You know, everything was about those contrasts. The writing is one thing. The, the problem, I think, the most difficult thing in any piece of writing is nearly always structural. So it's how you bring those together, how you wind the stories in, how you split, right, and you split geographically, you split temporally, you split character-wise, all those. those. That's where the hard work comes in. Um, we've got a few minutes left, so I'd just like to ask one question, one last question. Um, there's going to be an event on short stories uh, tomorrow uh, at the showcase, but uh, each of you has, even in connected with the novel in some way, has a kind of short story connection, so uh, some of your short story down the market in you writing 15. Or, it almost is an opposite. We see uh, someone sort of going into um, uh, Gaza, I think, or is it Palestine? Yeah, I've now forgotten. Yeah, it's West Bank. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's um, fine. Yeah, but, uh, but they, they keep comparing it to places in London. They keep saying it's nothing like Holloway. There's yeah. these kind of elements. Mm. Um, in the Wallstones paperback edition of Elizabeth is Missing, we see a sort of early version of that kind of character where she's, and it's even got that kind of like the bus issue is there again, which comes up again as if it's missing. And then in the dig, uh, yeah, as sort of mentioned, uh, a chapter from it was a standalone short story at one point. I was just wondering if the process of writing the short, short stories made you realise your, what you want to discuss was, was bigger than that, or if you feel there's a, when you get an idea, do you know it's a short story or you know it's a novel? Um, in, in my case, so I've talked about how this was a much bigger book, and I sat with my existing publishers at the time, Parthian, um, and told them, this is what I'm working on. I said, yeah, sounds great. And then when we sort of went, no, it doesn't work, we're just going to keep it, this farmer and this badger beta character. And I worked really hard to make sure that worked as a strong piece on its own, and gave it to Parthian and had the meeting, they turned and said, this is, no one wants to read this, this is terrible. Um, so you have a moment of a, a kind of, your confidence goes into free fall then, because you, you feel that you've done the right thing. And in the few days after that, I started to rip it apart again. I went, well, what's wrong? Maybe this section in the middle, which is like a sort of taut line of wire, is slowing the pace down, so I'll rip that out. And I sort of cast that aside. And in the same week, uh, Granta phoned, Granta magazine phoned, and said, listen, we've heard about um, Cullen's work, has he got something he could send us for consideration for the Britain edition? And I sent in two pieces, one about Corfu, one about Africa, and they said, no, no, Britain edition. <laughs> um, and I said, well, I've just ripped this, what about this? And sent, and sent that in, and they went, yep, this is great. That kind of restored the confidence, and I've 
went from that and put it back in and then rebuilt the book as it should have been and it came out in Granta, then suddenly the phone started ringing and said, oh, what's this novel? This is part of a novel. What's the novel about? So I made, oh, sorry, it's a short novel. We know you're not interested. Well, yeah, we are, we are now. Um, and there was this kind of scurry for it. So it was a really... Uh, it, did, it wasn't the fact that it was a short story and on the back of the success I kind of padded around it. It was there. It was, it was already part of the uh, structure. I would never have said that I wrote short stories at all. I, I mean, the, it was slightly embarrassing to have two stories. There's one in the Waterstones edition and a different one in the Sainsbury's edition. <laughs> Uh, and I would never have thought they were short stories. I mean, they were scraps. That, I mean, maybe a thousand words each, and they were, you know, half-hearted attempts or or kind of unsuccessful attempts anyway. Uh, and then suddenly they had to have something for the edition. So, and I mean, you know, it was they are truly what I was looking at when I was uh, kind of years off writing Maud. But um, it seems really strange to me that they are kind of now out there. Because, I mean, when I first got published, um, I felt like I was such a fraud because everyone else had all these short stories that they had, like, you know, they had them in magazines or they at least had them. They had written them. They, like, existed. And I didn't. I had only scraps, which now, which now published. <laughs> Seems very bizarre. In the back of books. <laughs> um, I, I started with writing short stories um, partly to just test my voice. I think it's... it's you can be far more experimental. I think there's a playfulness, and, and it's also the tightness. I think is really good training when you do a novel, that justification of every word. Particularly, I started... I mean, I had no contacts or at all in writing. I didn't know anybody who wrote. I didn't... Um, I was living in Bahrain. I was about as cut off as it was possible to be. I had a room with a blind that was down all the time because it was very, very bright outside. Um, and so it was just short story competitions that I started submitting to to get into writing. And it was, um, I think, that discipline of having very restricted word spaces and trying to think around a theme and, or, or be given an idea or a word that you have to work with I was very good at knowing how much you can kickstart your imagination. So that was a great experience. I, 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 I rarely write them now, but a couple, a couple, but yeah. Thank you. Right, um, we're just coming up to six o'clock, so uh, I'd just like to thank Kenan Jones, Emmy Healy, and Salma Dabo. Thank you.